guys, it's your girl T. So I wanted to go ahead and get this recap started for you guys. So make sure you guys have your teacups ready. Why? Because this recap is piping hot. How you doing? All right, so in the opening scene, we pick up right where we left off last week, and we're all at Gwen Fest. DJ Selfish is on stage. He's getting ready to announce the winner. Everybody's holding their breath. <gasps> And all of a sudden, he yells out that the winner of Gwen Fest is Young B. And the crowd goes crazy. Well, maybe like five people. But you know, everybody claps for her. And Young B is so happy. She breaks down crying. Yandy runs up to her and starts hugging her and says that she's so proud of her. BBOD, they're pissed the hell off. They end up leaving Gwen Fest all together. Congratulations to Young B. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what a Gwen Fest is, but... Kudos to you, bitch. Yes, Young B, enjoy your Gwen Fest award, okay? Moving on to the next scene. So the next scene, we had Dirty Feet Pete, honey. And when I tell you, his entrances crack me the hell up. It's like, where the hell is this dude coming from? He's walking in slow motion. He has his head held down. He's wearing some dark ass shades. And then it sounds like he's walking in some damn funeral music. You know, it's like... What the hell is this? And where the hell's Peter coming from any damn ways? So anyways, Peter ends up going to a clinic. He's filling out some forms. And he's telling us that he's finally decided to get his vasectomy. Everything that his daughter said to him last week really resonated with him. And he knows he needs to make the right decision. So now, just as we're all, you know, getting ready to applaud Peter for taking a step in the right direction, all of a sudden he gets up and he walks into the room. We're thinking about to chop off his balls. And no, Tara's ass is sitting there laying down getting an ultrasound. So the joke was on us. Peter was not getting a vasectomy. He was going to go see the sex of his baby with Tara. So while Tara's there, they're trying to get the sex of the baby. Tara's saying that she doesn't know. She's not sure. Peter's thinking that it might be a girl. But then the doctor's looking and the doctor's not so sure. And then Peter spots it first. And he's like, you know what? I don't think it's a girl. It looks like it's a boy. And you could tell that Tara's ass is pissed off. And she's like, oh yeah, his little thing is the same size as yours, Peter. And Peter's looking at Tara like, bitch, you will. And we know damn well Tara's lying. We all know Peter's ass gotta be hung like a horse. Cause no bitch is gonna trip off of a dude with a small peen. He has to be hung to have all these damn kids and for her and Amina to be playing tit for tat constantly with his damn sperm. So she can miss me with that little joke time my Peter is dingling. He's the same size as his baby in utero. Girl, bye. You know you was riding that big old thing every chance you damn got, okay? So anyways, Peter decides to tell Tara that he's decided on getting a vasectomy, but yet he has not told Amina yet, and Tara says that she'll believe Peter once she sees it. So then Peter's like, oh shit, you wanna see it? You wanna, you wanna see it? And I'm like, you know what? They're doing a little bit too much sexual flirting back and forth. I can't with Tara or Dirty Feet Pete. Moving on to the next scene. So the next scene, we have Remy Ma, honey. And once again, Papoose is meeting up with her. And they're going to go check out some linens and, you know, pick linens for the wedding. And Papoose is once again has a look of worry on his face. So he's asking Remy Ma how did Gwen Fest go. And Remy Ma says, you know what, it went pretty cool, but there was a little bit of some, you know, altercations or whatever. So Papoose is like, you know, what kind of altercations went down, Remy? You know, what happened? So Remy's telling Papoose that Rob basically washed some chick that was Jan. And he's friend. So now Papoose is pissed off. He's like, you know what? I'm not dealing with this. You know what I'm saying? It seems like this chick does not care about your well-being. She don't care if you in and out. And I feel like you're going down the same path that you went through previously, Remy. And I'm not trying to see you get locked up no more. You need to check the people that you're around. So now Remy's like, you know what, Papoose? You're taking it way too serious. It's not like she fought her in front of me. I was way on the other side of the club. And Papoose is saying that's not the point. You know what I mean? I don't want to lose you again. I just lost you for six years I'm not trying to go through all that so Remy's like well do you want to talk about what you went through you know in these six years because it seemed like it really affected you because I did my time I'm good and Papoose is like that's not the point you know what I mean you got put in this situation before and there was nothing I could do for you and that shit killed me like I was having to punch out walls and you know punch out windows and stuff like that because my girl was locked up so now I'm sitting there thinking to myself okay so while he's punching out windows and walls and everything else can somebody explain to me why Remy Ma and Papoose are acting like she was some innocent victim who did six years in prison? This woman shot somebody in the stomach and she went to jail for attempted murder. This is not some type of conspiracy. She needed to do those six years. She's very lucky that the woman that she shot did not die. Why does everybody on this show act so delusional as if these people are not guilty of the crimes that they committed? If I was to go out right now on the street and go shoot somebody and they didn't die, I'm going to be expected to go do time in prison. I don't 
don't understand why he's acting like it was the system's fault that she went to jail. No, this was Remy Ma's fault. This was Remy Ma not having any emotional self-control. At the end of the day, your friends can do what they want to do, but you have to be smart enough to walk away and not put yourself in certain situations. So I think Papoose needs to stop blaming everybody else for Remy Ma's mistakes. At the end of the day, this is the world that we live in. The world is not going to stop moving because Remy Ma's on probation. Folks are going to fight. Folks are going to get into stuff. And if she's that worried about her probation, then she shouldn't be at a Gwen Fest. Point blank, period. Moving on to the next scene. So in the next scene, we have Bumby, and she's in the studio working with this producer named Armadeus. I've never really heard of Armadeus, but supposedly he's worked with everybody from J-Lo to Remy Ma. She literally went through a whole list of people that Armadeus has worked for. So she's very excited because this was part of her package for winning Gwen Fest is that she gets to work with a dope producer. So Armadeus is saying that he can't wait to get in the studio with her and you know, just kill some tracks together. So while they're talking, in walks Malibu Barbie Lynn and Cardi B. And they're basically there to see what's going on, what went down at Gwen Fest. So then Cardi B takes her confession on, this is what she had to say. I'm so excited that Bianca won the Gwen Fest. Shawty's really talented, she deserves all of that. However, here goes Bianca again, having my same goddamn hairstyle. Like goddamn! Damn! But it's cool though. We can be fake looking sisters or whatever the crap. Let's skip to some drama. What happened there? Cause I know I heard about a couple of things. <laughs> So as you guys see, Cardi B's a hot mess. So now the three ladies get together and they all start talking about Gwen Fest. And once again, Malibu Barbie Lynn cannot keep BBOD's name out her damn mouth. I'm to the point where I think that this chick is obsessed with them because she just keeps talking about them continuously, okay? So she's basically letting Cardi B know that at Gwen Fest, she pulled the little paperwork out her bra to let Miss No Money know that basically she knew that Miss No Money was a snitch and that she got an order of protection on Bianca. And then she tells Cardi B that Miss No Money caught herself trying to dust her. No, bitch, she did dust you. Don't try and underplay it for Cardi B. Your ass got dusted and she pulled them damn tracks out your head. Don't act like you beat Miss No Money's ass. But of course, because Cardi B's her friend, Cardi B's gonna take up for Mariah Lynn. And then Cardi B tells Mariah Lynn, she tried to pop on you because you skinny and whatnot. You weigh about 100 pounds. That's what I hate about ugly bitches. They always wanna fight people. It's like, why you trying to be a thug? Your thug record is over. There's nothing you can do to recuperate the fact that you gotta order protection. I ain't worried about them bozo ass hyenas. And then she goes in her confessional. She's still going off about Miss No Money and Lexi, even though she told the girl she don't wanna hear nothing else about about them. So in her confessional, she's like, why you want beef with small little tiny Mariah? But then didn't want to pop off on Bianca when you saw her in the studio. That's some punk goofy type shit. But it's alright. If I was there, I'd have started a riot. <laughs> So like I tell y'all, every week, Cardi B says something crazy out her mouth. Then after that, they start talking about her boyfriend, Tommy. I don't care about that whole situation. Mariah Lynn starts talking about her mom and how her mom is all of a sudden now eight months pregnant. And now she's stressed because she feels like now she has to step up and take care of her baby brother or sister. That whole situation is just really damn ridiculous and ratchet. Moving on to the next scene. So in the next scene, we have Remy Ma, and she's going to go meet up with Ra Ali. And basically, they're at the Jula. Remy Ma is saying that she wants to get pop a new wedding man because he held her down for these six years and she really wants to do something special for him but she also wants to talk to Rob because she's upset about everything that went down at Gwen and Fest and she wants to find out more info so when Rob gets there she comes through she kisses Remy gives her a hug Remy's like you know what's up you know what, what happened at Gwen Fest what happened with you you could have got me in trouble so Rob saying that she feels bad she didn't mean to pop off but she's saying that the girl that she got into it at Gwen Fest is always talking shit to her online you you know, always popping off with her at the strip club. So Ra's like, well, you know what? After the fight, I spoke to Yandy, and Yandy was telling me that she didn't even know that you and her girl had beef. Now Ra Ali's upset. She's feeling tight. She's like, you know what? I'm going to let Remy Ma know how shady Yandy is, okay? Because that's one bitch that tries to act innocent, but ain't nothing innocent about Yandy Smith. Okay, now y'all know when Ra Ali starts whispering, it means some shit is about to go damn down, okay? So she's upset about this and she's telling Remy that she needs to open her eyes to Yandy and see that Yandy knows more than what she's telling her, but she promises Remy that she's not gonna start any mess at her wedding and that she's not gonna do anything to get Remy Ma into trouble. Moving on to the next scene. So in the next scene, we have Yandy and Medicaid and Medicaid has just been sentenced to eight years in prison and so they're playing all this slow, sad music and Medicaid is telling Yandy to keep her head up, don't stress herself out. They got the baby there, Skylar, and 
And, you know, they're really, really sad about the situation. Yandy starts crying. And she's saying, you know, I just, it's, it's just unfair. I can't believe that they try to get you for 10 years. You know what I'm saying? I, I can't even believe that you got to do time right now. And once again, a, another delusional ass chick. I love Yandy, but come on. Why are we acting like these people are political prisoners and like it's a conspiracy that these people are going to jail? Mendeecees was a dope boy for several years. He got away with selling dope for a long time. It wasn't like he was on the corner selling nickel bags of weed. This dude was pushing heroin. Yandy Smith is very lucky that all he got was eight years in prison. The only reason why he got that less of a time is because of this reality TV show. You know what I'm saying? Lucky for Mendeecees, he got a chance to be on this show and showcase his life, and he got a lot of people to like him, and I feel like that's why he got the eight years. Had this been Joe Schmo on the block, you know what I'm saying, pushing as much weight as Mendeecees was pushing, they would have easily got 20 years flat. No questions asked, nothing. So Yandy's very lucky that all he got was eight years. So as opposed to her being mad and acting like it's a conspiracy, she needs to be thanking God that that's all he got, okay? So after her little breakdown and her complaining about him getting eight years, Mendeecees decides to tell Yandy that he wants to get all the women in his life together, including his other two babies' mothers, because he feels like he's the glue that holds the family together. And Yandy's like, you know what, I've reached out to them, I've invited them to birthday parties, dinners, but they don't ever call me, they never make an attempt and Yandy says she's tired of it so Mendeecee says you know what we're gonna have a dinner we're gonna get everything you know squash we're gonna all talk I want my children to keep having a relationship with each other over the next eight years while I'm away regardless of what the mothers are feeling about the situation at the end of the day they're all siblings moving on to the next scene so in the next scene we have busted bitches on decline and they're super happy that they're back together and Uncle Tretch is basically helping them with their new music video once again, the lyrics to this new music video are straight up trash. They're talking about drinking Chris Dow for breakfast and their lyrics are nonsense once they get together. I swear these girls sound a lot better apart than they do together. So anyways, they're celebrating and Miss No Money is telling Unsexy Lexi that they need to find a manager for the both of them being that they're not solo anymore. And then she's also saying what I said last week that it's funny that Ra Ali can talk mess about her, but yet and still she popped off at Gwen Fest and got her her ass kicked out but she wants to judge more every time Mo pops off so now unsexy Lexi seeing that Ra may not be the right fit for her as a manager and Miss No Money seeing that you know what Ra and Yandy don't get along either that they may just have to find a separate manager outside of Yandy and outside of Ra but they'll talk about that later then Miss No Money goes in on Bianca and saying that she doesn't feel like Bianca should have won Gwen Fest and that Bianca looked a hot mess with her brown wig on. And when she said that, I had to give her the damn side eye. Like, I know damn well you're not talking about Bianca's wig being brown. When you're sitting here with a damn purple wig on, looking like a bootleg ass Shayna from Jim and the Holograms. I'm like, I know she's not trying to talk about nobody because that damn purple wig looked a hot mess on her, for real. So the whole situation was just a mess. So they're kind of going back and forth. Then they start talking about Malibu Barbie Lynn. But of course, Miss No Money's calling her Mariah No Carry. And she's saying that she needs to stay in her place and stop worrying about what she's doing and stop trying to Google information on her. And Unsexy Lexi agrees with Miss No Money that Miss Mariah Lynn needs to stay in her place and stay out their business. But for the meantime, they're both super excited they're back together. Moving on to the next scene. So in the next scene, we have Yandy, and she's meeting up with Remy, and basically they're gonna go pick out flowers because she told Remy that she would help her with the flowers for her wedding. So Remy's asking Yandy how she's feeling. She heard about Mendeecee's sentencing, and Yandy's saying that, you know what, she's just trying to, you know, just hold things up and hold things together. She's gone through a lot, and she's really upset that Mendeecee's is being punished for mistakes from his youth. <sighs> Once again, these damn delusional ass people on this show. This man did not make a mistake in his youth. It's not like Mendeecees is 15 years old. This man was arrested for moving weight within the past few years, meaning he was in his 30s. This is not a youth indiscretion. It's not like he killed somebody at 15 and now the feds are after him. This dude was pushing weight in his 30s, got arrested in his 30s, and now he's about to do time in his 30s. This was not a youth indiscretion. Where the hell do these people come from? Why are they so delusional when it comes to crime committed by their loved ones. I just don't get it. It's like, it boggles the damn mind. He's a grown ass man about to do time. Let him do his time, but stop trying to sugarcoat it and stop trying to act like it's some type of conspiracy against Medicaid, okay? Stop. <laughs> I swear that whole situation just has me frustrated. 
So anyways, Remy Ma is saying that she feels like Yandy's putting on a brave face. You know what I mean? And she's, you know, happy that she's able to put on a brave face. But she's still shocked that Yandy would want to help her with her wedding. So then Yandy tells Remy that she wants to throw her a bachelorette party. And she needs to dress sexy like a stripper. And of course, in her confessional, Remy Ma has an attitude once again. And she's like, you know, I don't get this. You know, that's not me. She wants me to dress like a stripper. I'm going to play along or whatever. But I'm not down with this whole bachelorette situation. And I'm just sitting there like, girl, come down don't nobody gotta throw you a bachelorette party she's going out her way to do this you know to do something nice show appreciation for once and stop being so what conceited moving on to the next scene so in the next scene we have tara the undercover hood rat honey and she's going to go meet up with yandy so yandy sees her and yandy is surprised because now tara's officially showing even in her confessional she's still wearing that ratchet ass fucking dress with her belly out now. So Yanny walks up and she's like, did you swallow a basketball? Like, what's going on here? And Ty was like, I know you haven't seen me for a while, but I'm pregnant. And Yandy's like, but I know I've talked to you within the past few months. Why didn't you tell me? And Tara said that she just didn't want any negativity. She didn't want any judgment. But she wants to let Yandy know that she's pregnant by the same person her other two children are by. As if this is just great news. So Yandy's like, well, the only thing I see is that my friend is pregnant by a married man. Now, when Yandy said that shit, I was like, damn. You could see it in Tara's face that Tara was all the way salty. She was not expecting for Yandy to call her out on her foolishness. Then she tells Yanny that Peter not only knocked her up, but also Mina, but supposedly Mina got an abortion. So now Yandy's just looking super disgusted by this entire situation. And Tara said that it's not her fault that she was in love with the man. This is somebody that she's been with for a long time, and you know, mistakes happen. My thing is, she's really acting like she was in a real relationship with Peter. No, Peter was honestly just having sex with you while he had sex with a bunch of other people. She's never really had a true relationship with Peter from everything she's told Dr. Jeff and everything that she's told us on this show. Peter has always played her from day one, so I don't understand why she wouldn't put herself in this situation. Then she goes into her confessional, she just starts talking this holier-than-thou type shit. In her confessional, she's saying that she's getting emotional because she realizes that she has changed and she's not going to be in a destructive relationship that's going to affect her and her children. And I'm sitting here like, okay, you're sitting here eight months pregnant, talking about you're not going to be in a destructive relationship, but yet and still you put yourself in a destructive situation to get pregnant by a man who does not care about you. This woman has to be one of the most delusional women on television, point blank, period. And the fact that this this broad has in her to be running the etiquette school, it just boggles the damn mind. So now Yandy asks Tara, are you okay with being a single mother and raising this child by yourself because you know Peter's not gonna be there? And she's saying she's fine with it. She's gonna be fine leaving the hospital by herself and raising her child by herself. She just does not care. She's just gonna take care of her child. Then of course she starts crying. And Yandy's just looking at Tara like she got shit on her forehead. This broad is stupid as hell. And then she has a nerve to say that she's the voice of all the women who are going through the same thing. Um, excuse me, bitch, I know plenty of women and they're not going through this ratchet ass shit that you and Amina are going through. So no, you're the voice of your damn self because no one besides your delusional ass thinks that what you got going on with Peter is okay. So don't try and pull a bunch of other women into your fuckery because the average woman out here is not gonna get themselves pregnant by a married man who has played and abused them time and time again over the past 13 years. So no, that's your shit, boo. Own up to it. You're not the voice of all women out here, point blank, period. Moving on to the next scene. So in the next scene, we have Cardi B, and she's at the bar with her sister and her homegirl. And she's, you know, feeling some type of way. She's saying a lot of people in New York are real fake. And then she's saying that M. Watson, DJ Selfish, and he said that he can hear Cardi B talking all the way from outside. You know, and he wants to know why she's popping out so hard. And then she tells DJ Self, I'm not fucking with your peanut-headed ass. And DJ Self was like, damn, why I gotta have a peanut head? What did I do? So she tells DJ Selfish, first of all, I'm mad because your little snow bunny told me about your Gwen Fest festivities, but you know what? That's not even why I'm mad at you though, okay? The reason why I'm mad is I feel like you don't really do nothing for me. I do everything for you, but when it comes to me, you don't do nothing. Why well, I gotta beg you like five fucking months straight for you to listen to a song, but you wanna sit here and support these goddamn Mariah Lynn's and all these odysseys. For God Christ's sake, I heard you put Ta 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 Licious on the radio. What the fuck is that? What are you doing? You're selling your soul. You selling your soul. So now DJ Selfish is trying to explain Explain himself. He's telling her to calm down. And he's saying, you know what? I'm a DJ. And as the messenger, that's what I do. I put music out there. They gave me their music in a professional package. You haven't done that. DJ Self says that he admits that him and Cardi B, they make some good money together. But that does not make her an artist. For whatever reason, DJ Self is not trying to fuck with Cardi B's music, okay? Then he says he doesn't know who made Cardi B the queen of this 
winning thing, but until she comes correct and she gives him her music professionally, there's nothing he can do for her. My thing is if she really wants her music played by him, then she needs to go on ahead and give this man a flash drive so that way he can finally hear her music and see the talent that she may or may not have because I don't know because I don't listen to Cardi B. So of course, Cardi B's mad and she's like, you know, you sitting here supporting these bitches who ain't doing nothing for you because they can't even do nothing for themselves, but you over here supporting them. Then she says that, yo, I'm so hot that my underarms are sweating. Then I was like, girl, bye. Too much information, honey. So now she's getting madder and madder. And she's like, you know what? You know why I'm so mad? I'm mad because I'm such a loyal person. When I fucks with people, I fucks with them heavy. And I feel Cardi B. I feel her anger. I'm the same way. Y'all remember that damn video I posted on Instagram this weekend? Don't you hate when people call you 24-7 with their fucking problems and their issues, and then when you're going through something and you call them, the only response you get is a, this fuckboy cannot be reached right now. How you doing? I'm the same way. When I have somebody that I care about, that I consider a friend, I fucks with them heavy, but unfortunately what I'm learning and what I've learned over the years is you can fuck with somebody heavy, you can be there for them 24-7, but then when you ask them to do the same for you in return, it's literally crickets. People are just shady as hell. Hell. People will take advantage of you if you give them an inch, they'll take a damn mile. And that's why you have to be careful who you give your time and energy towards because not everybody appreciates it. And DJ Self definitely comes off as that type of dude. You know, he likes getting money with her and watching her strip and go to parties and stuff like that and kicking it. But when it comes to looking out for her career wise, he don't want no parts of it. And you have people like that. And it's very, very hard to find genuine, like minded people. So I understand her frustration because I'm at my wits' end too. With with like just dealing with folks, not dealing with folks. I really wish that I too could have a really good best friend, honey, that I can go out of town with, kick it with, go shopping with, have a good time with. But honestly, as you get older, friendships like that are very few and very rare. So if you have a friend like that, definitely cherish them, hold on to them. If not, you will be finding yourself in the same situation as Cardi B going off on her so-called friend, DJ Selfish. So before Cardi B leaves, she tells Self, you gonna be real tight when you see me on that other level, you feel me? I'm about to go. So Self is like, why are you leaving? She's like, cause I don't wanna beat your ass in here in front of these white people. Then she gets to the door and she's like, that delicious. I felt the hell out. I'm like, Cardi B is a mess. And then DJ Selfish is sitting there like he has shit on his forehead. And he's like, why does everybody hate BBOD? I just, I don't get it. You know, he's such a damn mess. I can't with him. Moving on to the next. So the next thing we have Yandy. It's the day of the bachelorette party. And Remy Ma comes in in some red, lacy, see-through type ensemble. You know, she got the titties out. She got the booty showing and everything else. She got on her little six-inch heels. And she's ready to do the damn thing for her man, okay? She's ready to take these little stripper classes with Yandy. So then Ra Ali also comes in in this damn shiny-ass suit jacket. So she comes, and so Yandy says she wants to talk to Ra Ali. And Ra Ali's looking like, bitch, for what? And Yandy's like, you know what I mean? You really need to talk. So now they go back there, and they go to go talk. And basically, I did not even like this conversation. When Yandy talks to people, she literally looks at them like they're beneath her. The whole time Yandy's talking, and she just got a scar on her face like... <laughs> Yandy's a mess, and Raleigh's sitting there with her whispering ass, talking about some. You know, I know that you knew that girl. I know that that girl's your best friend. And Yandy's like, girl, bye. When I do things, when I bring people around me, you're the last person in my mind. I don't do stuff based on Raleigh. I don't even know you like that. And so now Ra Ali, you know, was kind of putting her place and now she's kind of salty because now Yandy's like, who are you for me to plan my life around? Like, you're nobody to me. So now Ra Ali's like, you know what? My issue is this. I feel like the only one you're trying to be cool with Remy is because me and Remy, we got into it. Had we not gotten into it that one time, there would be no place for Yandy and Remy, okay? Period. So I'm sitting there like, okay, she about to whip Yandy's ass because now she's whispering super low. And Yandy's like, yeah, okay, I haven't known Remy a long time, but me and her went out to dinner and we clicked and we're just cool. You know, what is the big deal? And I feel Yandy, you know what I'm saying? It's like Ra Ali is coming off like a scorned lover, like she was locked up for six years with Remy Ma and she was her girlfriend in prison. It's like, why are you so upset about Remy having other friends? You know, are we in kindergarten here? We're all grown. Adults can have friends with other friends. Even if you don't like that friend, that's 
should have nothing to do with Remy. Remy should be free to have a friendship with whoever she wants to have a friendship with the same way Ra Ali is free to do the same thing. So I don't understand what the problem is. They decide to shake on him, basically let this be water under a bridge. Yandy gets up to go finish hosting the party. Meanwhile, Ra Ali's sitting there looking crazy as hell, like she wants to really drag Yandy's ass up and down this damn bachelorette party. I don't push shit past Raw Ali. Yandy better watch her damn back, okay? Moving on to the next scene. So in the last and final scene, we have Medicaid, honey. And we have Medicaid, and he's going to the restaurant to meet up with his baby's mamas. Um, can you tell me why the restaurant is called Little Bastido? You know what I mean? Was there no other restaurant they could have went to? So anyways, they're all there. Um, so anyways, Mendices is there. Yandy's there. Erica, who is the scene's mom, is there. Um, Mendices' mother, Judy, with her messy ass, she's there. And then um, his first baby's mother, Samantha, she's Little Medicaid's mother. Um, she's there. And then her mom, who's clearly now a lesbian, is also there. Not only has Kim lost weight, honey, Kim was looking good. She like the 2000 five version of R. Kelly. She had them damn braids in her hair. Her damn braids were on point, honey. I was like, yes, Kim, work, work. <laughs> so that whole situation had me cracking up. So all these people are there at the restaurant. And so now Mendeecees is saying that, you know, he wants the family to be together. He wants to make sure that his boys are close and he's able to still see his kid. And so now Samantha, who's little Medicaid's mom, she's not sure she wants little Medicaid to come see big Medicaid in prison. And now everybody's kind of feeling some type of way. And then Judy pops up like, hold up now. First of all, you did time. You were locked up. You know what I'm saying? Nobody took your son from you. And so now Samantha's looking like, why the fuck would you bring up what the hell I did? This has nothing to do with the situation. And I was only locked up one day. See, that's why I don't nobody like Judy. Judy is messy as hell. Why is she talking like Samantha did 10 years in prison? She went to jail for a day and got out the same damn day. But the way she was talking, you would have thought that she did time like Remy Ma did time. You know, you cannot compare your son's situation to Samantha's situation. I definitely feel Samantha and Kim for popping off. And Kim was like, bitch, I ain't got on no suit. I ain't got on no suit. You're not going to disrespect my daughter. So Kim is going off. And I'm sitting with my teeth like, yes, bitch, yes. <laughs> Kim was going hard, honey. I was waiting for Kim to get up and snatch up Miss Judy because Miss Judy's always talking damn shit. Okay, first of all, your son put himself in this situation. Samantha don't owe him shit. What I don't understand is this, okay? Now, a lot of guys feel like if they go to jail, they should be able to see their kids. If the woman wants to bring her child to jail to come see the father, that's her business. But if a woman chooses not to engage in that fuckery, she has a right to do that. I don't think that anybody should shame Samantha because she's not okay with little Mendeecees going to go see his father in prison. You know, I just find that ridiculous. You know, that people are even mad at her or making her question herself. If you really love your kids, then you do your damnedest to stay out of jail. You know, I just don't understand this whole mentality. And the fact that there are these three women here and you have all these kids involved, I just find that situation is sad. So while Miss Judy's trying to blame Samantha and Kim for Mendeecees and him not being able to see his child, she needs to worry about her son and the mistakes that he's made. You know, she's very dismissive. She likes to downplay the mistakes that Mendeecees has made but has no problem throwing shade at Kim and Samantha and I just find that ridiculous. You know, this whole situation is just silly so Mendeecees is saying to Samantha like, you know, I need to see little Mendeecees. You need to bring him to come see me. That's not right. You know, I'm with him all the time. So Samantha's like, well, I don't know because if I was in jail, I wouldn't want my son to come see me in jail. I wouldn't want my son to come see me behind glass. So now here comes Yandy with this March of the Penguin voice talking about, well, you know, you know, we're raising black men in America and they need their fathers and me and you cannot teach our sons how to be fathers only their father Mendeecee can teach them how to be a man and I'm sitting there like well what all can he teach them when visiting is only you know maybe 30 minutes to an hour and they can only see him once a week there's not much he can teach them you know what I mean and I hear that you know if guys are locked up you should bring your kids to go see them so that way they can still have that bond to each his own, like I said, some, I know some girls who do that and they're cool with that, but that's just not my cup of tea. I don't got time to be trying to drive an hour or two to go see no fool in prison and drag my kids. I, I just don't have time for the foolishness. And another thing I find foolish with this whole situation, this man is out here with four kids with three different women. Now, let this have been a female, okay? Let this have been a female and she had four kids by three different men and they were all sitting here at this dinner table arguing about, you know, are they going to take the kids to the prison and come see the mama and everything? 
this would not fly on television. Nobody would be supporting this. If this was a black woman with, with four kids by three different people telling my wanting her baby's fathers to bring her kids to come see her, she'd be all types of hoes and thoughts. They'd be all types of hate videos about her. But because it's a man, this is just supposed to be acceptable. And I just find the whole situation just crazy, okay? Now, I will say this. Mendices is a good dad. He does spend a lot of time with his children. And, you know, he seems like a really good father. Like, he's always kept his kids. He just made some mistakes. And I'm not knocking him for those mistakes. We all make mistakes. But with mistakes, there's consequences, okay? So I'll never take that from him and say that he's a horrible father. No, he just made a mistake. But I don't feel like Samantha should be pressured to have little Mendices go to prison to go see him if she does not feel comfortable. At the end of the day, that's Samantha's child, not Yandy's. If Yandy's okay with dragging her kids to a prison to go see Mendices every week, that's cool. That's on Yandy. She can do that. But I don't think it's okay for the other mothers to try and pressure Samantha or make it seem like she's wrong for her decision or that she's wrong for her opinion. But after all that pressure, she finally did decide to let little Mendices go see big Mendices in prison. So the whole situation is just crazy. And I just find the whole situation just sad that he's going to be in there for the next eight years. You know, when he gets out, his baby girl, who's like a year old, will be eight years old. Little Mendices will be like 18 or 19. So the whole situation is just insane but hopefully this will wake a lot of young men up who do watch this show to realize that your decisions and the things that you're doing can really affect those who you love not just your mother not just the adults in your life but your children as well so anyways you guys let's go ahead and get the discussion popping that is my recap for this week's episode of love and hip hop new york go ahead and leave a comment let's go ahead and get the discussion popping all right deuces hey you guys it's your girl t make sure to subscribe like and share my videos you can also visit lovelytea.com to purchase any merchandise also don't forget to click the boxes down below to watch any of my previous videos talk to y'all later deuces